distance across the fall is likely to cause... Mount Everest, at 29,028 feet, the highest point on Earth. Before 1953, it was thought to be an unassailable peak. It wasn't just the gravity-defying climb of more than five miles straight up that daunted. It was the barren, deathly solitude of the place. Air too thin to breathe. Winds over a hundred miles an hour. Temperatures plunging 60 degrees below zero. And an approach pitted with avalanches, crevasses, and ever-shifting glaciers. While the world's other remote and uncharted regions were claimed by explorers, Everest alone remained inviolate, the final frontier of man's terrestrial adventures. The Germans used to call it the third pole, like uh, the North Pole, South Pole, and, and the top of the world. And that obviously held a magnetic attraction for all mountaineers. Many had tried to conquer Everest. None had succeeded until the day in May 1953, when a British expedition reached the summit against all odds. To me, it was the last great amateur sporting event of the world, almost. Uh, no one had industrial logos on all their clothing. Uh, you hadn't got mega bucks running the thing. Uh, it really was, remarkably, a beekeeper and a sherpa. It couldn't have been better cast by Hollywood or anyone else. The beekeeper was a New Zealander, Edmund Hillary and the Sherpa was Tenzing Norgay. On the face of it, theirs was an untarnished triumph. But beyond the Himalayas, Hillary and Tenzing would encounter hazards every bit as treacherous as their journey up the slopes of Everest. For at the bottom of the mountain, amidst the rejoicing, controversy and discord lurked. Hillary and Tenzing would be changed forever, and all because they climbed a mountain. Mount Everest stands in the Himalayan mountain range to the north of India, between Nepal and Tibet, a region dominated by the British in the days of empire. Everest was traditionally considered British property. Its very name came from a British surveyor, George Everest, who first measured the world's highest mountain. The British had had, you might say, almost sole rights to the mountain from the days of British India, and uh, some dozen expeditions had tried and, and failed. British mountaineering had been an important symbol of British manliness and British power since the mid-19th century, at least. It was the symbol of how these men could conquer a mountain put their feet on the top and claim it as their own. Absolute crest. The pinnacle of the world. And we know no more about it than we do of the moon. The last mystery, Blacker. Everton, are you on for a really first class show? The ambition of conquest which drove the British was not shared by those who lived at the foot of the mountain. The Sherpa people were the indigenous inhabitants of the Himalayas. British expeditions recruited the Sherpas to guide them through the perilous journey to Everest and to carry heavy loads. The Sherpas called the mountain Chomolongma, the goddess mother of the earth. To them it was a sacred place held in reverence and awe. <laughs> But in the 1930s, a Sherpa emerged who was different from the others. Tenzing Norgay was born in Nepal in the shadow of the Himalayas. As a young man, he ran away from home and arrived in Darjeeling in northeast India. This was the place where the British recruited their porters for expeditions. Many Sherpas had gone there to make a living from portering. Tenzing went there with another ambition, 
to get to the summit himself. In 1935, Tenzing, with one of the porters recruited in Darjeeling to accompany the expedition, um, and he was then our youngest Sherpa, um, just 21, and he acted as my personal servant um, on all three expeditions in the 30s. In the end, I think Tenzing became very keen to get to the top of Everest. He wanted to be like his sides. <laughs> but Tenzing's climbing opportunities with the British were limited. In the 1930s, the Sherpas were porters and servants. The serious climbing and the attempts on the summit itself were strictly for the Sahibs. People who were porters, Sherpas, were, in a sense, coolies. They were a rather high-class coolie. And they didn't expect themselves to have any better treatment uh, than um, an ordinary Indian servant would have. For Tenzing, the opportunity to be taken seriously as a climber would come as a result of the sweeping political changes in the Himalayan region after World War II. In 1947, the British pulled out of India ending their dominance of the area. Three years later, Tibet, the traditional route to Mount Everest, was invaded by communist China and its borders sealed. The only other way to reach Everest was through Nepal. Its borders had been closed to foreigners for hundreds of years, but in 1950, Nepal opened its frontiers for the first time. Faut dire que c'était un peu fermé tant qu'ils étaient aux Indes pour les autres. C'est quand le Népal a ouvert ses portes que les expéditions étrangères aux Anglais ont pu rentrer au Népal et voir les restes. In 1952, Raymond Lambert led a Swiss expedition to Everest. They were the first non-British climbers to attempt the mountain. They were also the first to give a climbing opportunity to one of their Sherpas. The Swiss broke a big barrier by making Tenzing an official member of the expedition and then uh, a wonderful relationship developed between um, uh, Raymond Lambert and, <coughs> and Tenzing. The difference is that they considered as friends, like us. Maybe with the British, there was a certain difference. Marqué par les Britanniques. Mais pour nous, Tenzing et les autres serpents et les coulis, c'était plutôt des, des compagnons. On est resté amis un peu avec tout le monde. Tenzing surtout. The Swiss attempt was the making of Tenzing's reputation as a climber. Together with Lambert, Tenzing made an assault on the summit itself. Just 800 feet from the top, they were forced back by a snowstorm. No one had ever got closer. In Britain, the news of Lambert and Tenzing's heroic attempt was received with some concern. The mountain the British regarded as their property had almost been conquered by another country. Worse still, the French would be mounting an expedition in 1954. But the British had booked the mountain for 1953. Convinced this would be their last chance to conquer Everest, Britain's two major climbing organizations, the Royal Geographical Society and the Alpine Club, joined forces to organize an expedition. Colonel John Hunt, a serving army officer, was chosen to lead. Competition aspect was giving grave concern. So uh, I, I went at the problem, uh, if you like, from a military background, uh, quite certain that the one rather simple objective was to get to the top. John Hunt's plan was to break Everest down in stages. A series of support camps would be built along the face of the mountain, forming a massive pyramid of human effort 
which would, the British hoped, hoist one pair of climbers onto the summit itself. No effort was spared. The most advanced British technology was employed. Nothing was left to chance. In February of 1953, the British expedition set sail for Everest full of confidence. There was Major Charles Wiley, a Gurkha officer, George Band, a Cambridge student, Mike Westmacott, an Oxford student, Michael Ward, the team doctor, Griffith Pugh, the physiologist, Wilfred Noyce, a schoolmaster, Tom Bordillon, a research scientist, Charles Evans, a surgeon, and Alf Gregory, a Blackpool travel agent. In India, the nine British climbers met up with two New Zealanders, George Lowe, a teacher, and Edmund Hillary, immediately distinguished by his choice of headwear. Ed wanted a, a good sun hat when he went to Everest, and uh, they weren't available in the shops, and we didn't have the money to go and buy uh, these sort of things anyhow. And so my wife at the time, um, made him a hat out of my pyjama material. He was very tough, a bit of a rough diamond. He'd been to university, I think, for about a year, but uh, felt that a year was enough, probably. And he had an unusual business with his brother, uh, keeping bees professionally, uh, developing, you know, 15, 20 tonnes of honey a year. And luckily, the season of the year when the bees go to sleep coincided with the New Zealand and the Himalayan climbing season. At that stage of his life, there were only two things that interested him, and that was beekeeping and climbing. It would be the challenge of climbing that Ed loved, I think. He loved the solitude, he loved the mountains. He tended to be, in a way, a bit of a loner. Hillary had become well known in British climbing circles, accompanying several British expeditions to the Himalayas in the 1940s and 50s. He had earned a reputation as an athletic climber, but more importantly, a determined one. The word ruthless has been used to me by several people, sometimes unquotably, but yes, uh, I think he's certainly single-minded, and I think when he sets his mind on things, it achieves them. I think he'd had a touch of ruthlessness in him. He knew very well that if he got the chance, he was going to have a jolly good go at that peak. He's very strong on, um, on his desire to get to Everest. The final climber to join the team was Tenzing Norgay. The British felt they needed Tenzing because of his accomplishments with the Swiss the previous year. He'd now been on Everest more times than any other climber in the world. But Tenzing himself had some doubts about joining the British. Tenzing had no envie to repartir encore. Comme j'ai dit, he wanted to wait qu'on repart, nous, les Swiss. On avait lié une telle amitié. Il semblait que impossible de faire autrement. On ne pouvait pas aller à l'Everest sans lui, ni lui sans nous. C'était ça le problème. Et c'est moi qui lui ai dit, « T'as l'occasion peut-être de faire l'Everest, alors va. Hein? » Qu'il soit anglais ou néo-zélandais, ça n'a pas d'importance, pourvu que tu ailles au sommet. Once he had decided to return to Everest with the British, Tenzing resolved that this time he would reach the summit, whatever the cost. Before going, he wanted an assurance from me. That this time, if I go to Everest, I will either do it or die. I will never come back unsuccessful. But in case of my death, we will look after my family. So I gave him this solemn assurance that Tenzing, if I get a morsel of food to eat, your family would go unstarved. Uh, I will look to your family. So with this assurance, he left Darjeeling. Tenzing travelled to Kathmandu ahead of the British team. When he reported to the British Embassy, his initial reservations were immediately borne out. When Tenzing first arrived with some of the Sherpas, he was um, sent by the embassy, British Embassy staff uh, to occupy one of the 
ordinary rooms in what was known as the lines, where the um, uh, porters and other people would sleep. By that time, Tenzing had a status which was rather higher than that would imply, and he was offended by that. Um, but of course, that was not the doing of the expedition, which hadn't arrived. It was the doing of the embassy staff, who quite frankly couldn't be expected to know any better at that point. Um, but that was uh, something he might have resented, and I think probably did resent. But there was no outward sign of resentment when Tenzing greeted the rest of the team in Kathmandu. And Colonel Hunt quickly made it clear that Tenzing was to be nothing less than a full member of the climbing team. I'd put him in a different category from the very moment we met. I asked him to join the climbing team, knowing his background. We were very lucky just to have this one man. He was ambitious, no question about that, as a mountaineer. We knew that uh, of all the members of the expedition, he had been higher on Everest than anybody else. <clears throat> in fact, he really held the altitude record in the world. And so he had a great standing with us. I think we all had an extremely high regard for him. He hadn't had any conventional education, um, spoke a little bit of English in those days, uh, but he was very much a sort of uh, nature's gentleman and, uh, and, and a wonderful smile and a uh, you know, very nice person altogether. However, despite full recognition as a climber, Tenzing was also appointed Sirdar, the chief of the Sherpa porters. Tenzing had been a Sirdar before, but now that he was a climber, his dual role brought problems. His, his role was a difficult one because he was the mediator between the British and the Sherpas. Uh, there were disputes over equipment, over levels of pay. He says in his autobiography that both the British and the, his fellow Sherpas thought that he was working on behalf of the other side. I felt like the middle of a sandwich pressed between two slabs of bread. And the Sherpas seemed to think I was being paid big money by the British to argue against them. While the Sherpas saw him as a lackey of the British, the British sometimes doubted his ability to maintain discipline over their employees. Tenzing was a good Sardar, though not, not a particularly strong one. Uh, um, people did uh, accuse him of being too kind to his fellow porters sometimes, I think. My own personal relations with the British were quite satisfactory. Colonel Hunt was a fine man, and all the others were pleasant and considerate to me. But there was not the informal, easy comradeship there had been with the Swiss. I did not share a tent with one of them, as I had with Lombert. And there was not much joking and horseplay between us. It's perfectly true that um, um, the Swiss knew to the... Uh, Indian and Himalayan scene. Um, I think they they didn't have this background of empire, and the Sherpas uh, were treated much more in a, uh, whether they were carrying loads or climbing with them, were treated uh, on a, a more friendly, equal basis than perhaps we did. Um, and I'm afraid this is a product of our um, uh, the Indian Raj. It took 16 days to climb up the foothills of the Himalayas and reach the foot of Everest. There, base camp was established. Now began the arduous task of setting up a series of smaller camps that would take them step by step towards the summit. But the going was tough. Technology and planning alone wouldn't get them to the top. Ultimately, everything rested on human endeavor. It was now that Tenzing's standing with his fellow Sherpas was to be tested by a major crisis. There were grave anxieties uh, as we got nearer to the top. We were having great trouble in uh, preparing a route, making a way up the big 4,000 foot uh, steep ice slope known as the Lhotse Face. And I sent two groups of Sherpas up to the halfway point where we had a camp. 
कोई सरबले पेरे उसमें आ रखो राशन तंबू आ रखो पुरानो मिले ऑक्सीजन पुरानो त्यागर रहा है ना पुनो जा मोजे ती पहले जब पुनो जे दूसरा तो ऑक्सीजन पुरानो का को दियो एक ऑक्सीजन को तेईस पाउंड दियो दो ऑक्सीजन का छहलीस पाउंड बगैर मो दूसरा भी का को दियो Unable to go any further, they couldn't be persuaded to do the fast, the last 2,000 feet to the South Car. And at that point, I really felt that we must do something drastic. And so I asked Ed Hillary and Tenzing uh, if they'd go up, and in particular Tenzing, persuade the Sherpas to go on and do the last lap and carry those vital 900 pounds of stores onto the South Car. And the next morning, the relief when we saw the whole uh, 17 Sherpas, I think it was, uh, getting very, very slowly to, on, to climb the upper slopes and reach the South Goal. And that was entirely because of Tenzing's leadership and Tenzing's persuasive power on, on his own people. They respected him enormously. With the expedition now within striking distance of the summit itself, Colonel Hunt had to choose the two men who would make the final assault. He opted for Hillary and Tenzing. There was very little doubt among the party that those two men, Ed Hillary and Tenzing, were the two with the greatest chance of making it, the two strongest. So I don't think there was much quarrel with John's selection, even though everybody else would have liked to have a chance. Hunt's concern was to choose the two men best qualified for the task. But he was also motivated by a broader vision for the expedition as something more than just a British triumph. I wasn't the slightest bit concerned about which representatives of which nationality got to the top, as between New Zealanders and British and so on. Uh, but I, I had a, a great desire to see a, a, a Nepali, in, a Sherpa, on the summit, given the enormous contribution that the Sherpa people had made to all the expeditions since the attempt on Everest started. Hillary and Tenzing and a support party, which included Hillary's friend George Lowe, established a camp 1,100 feet from the summit. For the final assault, Hillary and Tenzing would be on their own. On the morning of the 29th of May, Tenzing's 39th birthday, they set off for the top. I remember the day very vividly. They left early in the morning and I knew they were on their way. And I saw them go over the south summit and then they were out of my sight. It would be 10 long hours before George Lowe saw them again. Among the snowy humps, I kept wondering, is the next the last one? Finally, we reached a place where we could see past the humps. We could see the summit. We stepped up. We were there. The dream had come true. I was too tired and too conscious of the long way down to safety, really, to feel any great elation. I turned and looked at Tenzing. I held out my hand and in silence we shook in good Anglo-Saxon fashion. But this was not enough for Tenzing. I waved my arms in the air and then threw them around Hillary. At that moment for which I had waited all my life, my mountain did not seem to me a lifeless thing of ice and rock but warm and friendly and living. I gave my thanks. I am grateful. It was now that a picture was taken that would come to define the conquest of Everest. Tenzing on the summit. But there was to be no picture of Hillary. I didn't worry about getting Tenzing to take a photograph of me. As far as I knew, he had never taken a photograph before. 
and the summit of Everest was hardly the place to show him how. After just ten minutes on the roof of the world, the two began their journey down. But before leaving, Hillary had an urgent call of nature to attend to. Coming down has as much um, stress quality and problems as going up. You've also got a problem with getting rid of a lot of moisture and to actually relieve himself and actually pee on the summit um, was a good point as far as he was concerned. When they reappeared on the south summit early in the afternoon, I felt certain that they'd made it and I met them about 200 yards away from the tents. And I went down on my knee and was filling the thermos flask of Ed a, a drink, which they were very clean, keen to have. And um, Ed made his famous remark, well, we knocked the bastard off. And that was, you know, said in a sort of amazement, you know, me, Ed Hillary, we've, we've got there. Hillary and Tenzing each expressed very different sentiments about reaching the summit. Tenzing at the top made an offering and said a prayer. I'm grateful, Choma Lungma. Hillary returned and told his friend Lo that we knocked the bastard off. What's remarkable is not that these two views were different. The world is full of such differences in opinion. What's truly remarkable is that they each felt this way about the same mountain and managed to climb it together. Meanwhile, Hunt and the rest of the expedition waited anxiously further down the mountain. On the morning of the 30th of May, we were waiting uh, for news and they appeared over the crest of the coral. George Lowe, I remember, stuck his thumbs up and Ed Hillary turned and pointed his axe to the summit and the impact on, well, all of us, I can only speak for myself, was um, electrifying. Uh, I'm bound to confess I was in floods of tears. I staggered up to meet them, being incapable of, incapable of running and we found ourselves embracing each other in a good old-fashioned way. It was a wonderful moment. Ed Hillary did practically all the talking. Tenzing seemed to me to be much more quietly happy about it than Ed. Uh, one rather touching thing was when <coughs> um, Tenzing was received by the other Sherpas who um, almost bowed their heads to him. And they welcomed him in a, in a very quiet way and they were obviously proud of him. reached Britain on the eve of Coronation Day. Described by the press as a coronation gift to Her Majesty, the conquest of Everest was perceived as another great British achievement. The uh, genealogy, if you like, of uh, the ascent of Everest was 90% British, I suppose. Though, uh, when I say British, it's not basically domestic English when you think of a New Zealand beekeeper and a Sherpa. But I think that's a nice picture of what the empire and its uh, Victorian heyday was about. It was about beekeepers and Sherpas. It was not uh, redcoats marching over battlefields, really. It's far more sympathetic than that. Much nicer picture. I liked it. Meanwhile, back in Nepal, the weary party made their way down the mountain. They had no idea of the excitement their achievement had generated. 
The first taste of what was in store came with news brought by a runner that Edmund Hillary was to receive a knighthood. We were walking out from Everest when we received a letter um, saying Mr. Edmund Hillary, KBE, Knight of the British Empire, and uh, he said, someone's having an ugly joke, aren't they? He really did not believe it. He almost thought it in the early stages of um, refusing it. But um, I suppose by the time uh, he had got out of Nepal, and that took some weeks to walk out, and through India, uh, I suppose he got a bit used to the idea. <laughs> But Hillary's knighthood would be quickly overshadowed. The spotlight of worldwide interest is focused for the moment on Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal. Kathmandu awaits the conquerors of Everest. When they got to Kathmandu, the climbers would be amazed by the public reaction which awaited them. We were greeted uh, in the outskirts of the capital, Kathmandu, by the royal coach and four horses. Tenzing and I and Hillary were stowed into the coach, and as we went along, we were showered with flowers until we were inundated. We were invisible except for Tenzing, who was standing, re receiving the greetings. He had a seat of honor at the top. They were shouting, Tenzing Zindabar, Tenzing Zindabar, long live Tenzing. It was extraordinary. It was quickly becoming clear that the Nepalese had seized on one man alone as the conqueror of Everest, Tenzing. We sent a wave of you know, spontaneous jubilation and the whole atmosphere was charged with enthusiasm that, of course, well, we did not know what is mountaineering. We did not know what it was, actually. But everywhere there was singing and dancing to worship, adore, to just uh, welcome the hero of the Everest, Tenji. Sunaula Himal Sagarmatha Chadne Pratham over our heads were triumphal arches uh, with legends, you know, conquering heroes and pictures of Tenzing on the summit, hauling up uh, an apparently unconscious Hillary. Kathmandu was now full of images of Tenzing at the top of the mountain. Bolstered by the evidence of the famous summit photo, the assumption had taken hold that Tenzing got there first. The Times special correspondent in Kathmandu expressed outrage. Many are now implying that this final victory was Tenzing's alone, that he cut a route, blazed the trail, and finally hauled Hillary to the summit on a rope. Nothing could be further from the truth. Tenzing was employed by the expedition as a sirdar. It was Hillary who led the rope to the summit. Only two people really knew who got there first, and they were keeping silent on the issue, a decision endorsed by the whole team. We had agreed amongst ourselves that we would never say who reached the summit first. It was climbed together, and you cannot climb it without combining and having a teamwork to get together. We'd never asked him, either of them, who did get to the top first. We didn't know, and didn't want to know, because uh, mountaineers see the uh, driving on the summit of a mountain as a, as a joint effort. You're on a rope, and who's in front and who isn't doesn't matter. It was totally against John Hunt's concept of togetherness. The idea of one of the East and one of the West would help to cement, and people were immediately trying to destroy that cement. That was an ugly part, and we were all uh, upset by that. 
the expedition member with most reason to be upset was Edmund Hillary. I remember him telling me at the time of, you know, driving through with these great banners up, welcoming uh, Tenzing, the first man to climb Everest, and with drawings of them of Tenzing at the top and him dangling off a rope somewhere down the slope would be very difficult to take. And of one uh, huge function in which uh, Tenzing got an uproarious reception as the first man to climb Everest, and then as an afterthought, Ed was introduced, uh, perhaps we'd also like to hear from the second man to climb the mountain. Um, and um, he says how he could he actually hear his footsteps as he walked across to the microphone, dead silence. Well, that must have been very hard to take. As Tenzing fever mounted, the expedition's refusal to say who got to the top first inflamed the controversy. Convinced that the British were hiding the truth and denying Tenzing his due, the Nepalese press were now primed to pounce. John Hunt gave a press conference and he was asked whether he considered Tenzing a, a great mountaineer. And, and John, very honest chap, said, <clears throat> yes, he is a great mountaineer, but of course you can't compare him with the, with the great alpinists for very technical climbing. Um, and of course the press rushed across to Tenzing and said, John Hunt says you're not a good mountaineer. <laughs> and poor Tenzing <clears throat> sort of was bewildered by this. He said, well, has anybody else been on Everest seven times? <laughs> Which was true. As you can imagine, I was very disappointed that it, it turned out that way. But at the time, we had to contend with that on top of our great weariness and all the glorification and um, honours that were being bestowed upon us. It, it, it was a, a, a very difficult and exhausting time. At the centre of the whirlwind was Tenzing Norgay. Illiterate and unused to any sort of publicity, Tenzing now found himself the focus of the most intense national pride. He even received death threats from Nepalese angered by his refusal to say that he got to the top first. Others favoured more devious tactics. A group of newsmen from India got a, a piece of paper to Tenzing which asked him for his signature. And on the piece of paper, when he got the piece of paper and they got his signature, they shouted excitement, we've got it, we've got it. And it said, I reached the summit first, Tenzing. And then they went off with that. Now, he went into tears about that. He came and he said to Charles Wiley, who was really interpreting and staying with him, he said, I, I, there are many bad men in the world and I just do not know, it's not, you know, I, I am very upset by this. And he said, I wished I'd never climbed Everest. John Hunt now decided enough was enough. He called a press conference at which a carefully worded statement was issued, jointly signed by Hillary and Tenzing. It read, as we climbed to the summit, first one, then the other would take a turn at leading. We reached the summit almost together. The phrasing, which formally gave Tenzing a status equal to Hillary, defused the situation for the moment. The statement made that the two stepped there simultaneously, uh, that was what, you know, resolved the controversy and that's what's on record and in retrospect it looks at other silly controversy as to what difference does it make, who stepped, as long as both of them were there. But at that time it was a highly emotive issue. It was with some relief that the British party, including Tenzing, left Nepal to begin their journey back to Britain. Their route would take them next through India. Before the climb, they'd passed through India virtually unnoticed. Their return would be very different. Later, they flew to New Delhi, where a huge throng almost mobbed them and their plane on the Willingdon airfield. Here again, it was Tenzing who was the focus of attention. Tenzing had lived in Darjeeling in northeast India for over 20 years, and he was now claimed as India's national hero. Tenzing became a focus of national pride, that someone from among us has done something which was until recently considered only a white man's kind of pastime. It was only five years since India had gained its independence from Britain, and Indians readily identified with Tenzing's rise from porter to climber. Tenzing was a symbol of the fact that here is a person who is humble, more or less illiterate, who has been a in a servant position, and yet he is able to accomplish uh, as an equal of Hillary. So there was the feeling that uh, we Indians can now accomplish anything. We can conquer Everest, we can develop, we can become a 
super power we can do whatever we set out to to do or achieve but for tenzing being a symbol of india's national pride brought new problems they focused very simply on the question of his own national identity there was a crisis for tenzing because the nepalese said he's nepalese the indians said he's an indian and they asked him uh, what are you are you a nepalese or are you an indian and he said I was born in Nepal, my heart is in Nepal, I live in India. Now that was a masterly reply, but from an honest man. And yet they still kept on, the Indians said, it's, you know, it, it's an Indian triumph. The Nepalese said, Tenzing Zindabar. <laughs> when he left for England with the rest of the expedition two weeks later, Tenzing travelled with two passports, one Nepalese and one Indian. At London Airport, Colonel Hunt and Sherpa Tensing were the first to be greeted by Sir Edwin Herbert, Himalayan Society President and Brigadier Head, War Secretary. When the expedition returned to London, Tenzing was, to some extent, the centre of attention. He was someone people had not seen before, um, he was different, he spoke English not very well, and so people wanted to see what this man was like. And now uh, we want viewers to meet Tenzing. First of all, a lot of English wives would like me to ask him what, what, uh, what does his wife think about all this going off in the mountains? Well, he says that uh, his, his children and his mother and naturally his wife too are not too keen on it for obvious reasons. <laughs> In conjunction with the Queen's garden party at Buckingham Palace, Her Majesty held an investiture at which Colonel Sir John Hunt and Sir Edmund Hillary, seen here driving in, received their knighthoods. Sherpa Tensing, who was awarded the George Medal, came with his wife and two daughters. Major the award of a George Medal for Tensing, a far lesser honour than a knighthood, prompted accusations of unfairness from some, but Tensing himself gave no indication of being offended. In fact, his main concern seemed to be avoiding contentious issues altogether. When Tenzing Norke was asked how he felt, his cheery answers had to be interpreted, of course. He was often asked how he felt when he reached the summit of Everest, and he said he was very happy. He was very happy. <laughs> and in fact, an Indian interviewer asked him, well, in these earlier interviews, you've said you were happy, but how did you really feel when you got there to the, to the summit? And Tenzing said, he felt good. And the interview said, felt good? So, yes, felt good. We'd attempted the climb many times, and we'd finally made it. That was, in fact, how Tenzing sincerely felt about the ascent. He appears to have just wanted to climb the mountain, that he wanted to re reject the political implications that were put upon his achievement by others. For the most part, Tenzing's stay in England afforded him a welcome respite from controversy before returning home. In October, a feature-length documentary of the climb, The Conquest of Everest, opened in London. Now, Edmund Hillary was the centre of attention. Tiger Tenzing was back in his own country, but fellow conqueror Sir Edmund Hillary was there. Hillary was under the spotlight in London. But that was nothing compared to the homecoming he would shortly receive when he returned to New Zealand. Auckland sees the end of an epic journey to and from the top of the world and a crowd of thousands wait to welcome New Zealand heroes. From aboard the Solent flying boat, Sir Edmund Hillary and George Lowe emerged to report all's well. They came off this, it was sort of a pontoon, you know, with a flying boat, and, and here were members of the Alpine Club with their ice axes to form an arch, and there were streamers, and, and there was just a, a complete uproar. And of course, Ed and, and George Lowe were, were quite overwhelmed by it, because they hadn't expected anything like it. Ed was at his sort of gawky and, and shy and most naive, and George Lowe was being all supportive. And it really was, it was a wonderful occasion. It was sort of, there was a village quality about it. And in terms of scale to the size of the city, uh, I don't think there's any, been anything quite like it since. My bar the Beatles, they weren't local. Fellow alpinists and many others struggled for a foothold. Ed said that the reception that he had from the public of Auckland, uh, he found the most frightening and the most um, uh, sort of emotional of all. 
All the others, you know, it's those people all out there. But the reception in Auckland really moved him. This was not the civic welcome, but a truly spontaneous greeting by his admirers and friends. All the excuse they needed was they were fellow New Zealanders. I think it was one of those things which proved to New Zealanders that we could do more than simply uh, produce butter and cheese and play rugby. Even the physique of him at that time, angular, tall, shy, um, rather naive, seemed to fit the whole picture of the farmer who comes off the farm, be it a bee farm or whatever it is, and climbs Everest just in the process of a day's work. The typical Kiwi joker. What do you consider were the highlights of your trip to Everest? Well, I suppose the main highlights were the actual bits on the mountain itself. While Hillary adjusted to his newfound celebrity in New Zealand, Tenzing was finding that his status as a symbol of Indian national pride was to be cemented by the friendship of India's president, Nehru. Nehru cranked it up in a big way. He was a man of the mountains, a lover of the mountains, his writings are full of it. And while being so deeply in love with the mountains himself, Nehru was also painfully aware that Indians as a people weren't mountain-loving, that they lacked the spirit of adventure. And he seized upon this conquest of Everest and the personality of Tenzing as one way of galvanizing India behind adventure, behind mountaineering, behind doing things as spectacular as the conquest of the Everest. Amidst much publicity, Nehru opened the Himalayan Mountaineering Institute. Located in Tenzing's adopted town of Darjeeling, it was a showcase training school, which Nehru proclaimed would produce a thousand Tenzings. Tenzing himself was appointed chief instructor, a job Nehru promised him for life. He was very, very popular. From his house he would leave for our institute, which was about four or five kilometers away. On the way he'd be signing, giving autographs to young people. It is the style of living he wanted to live, more like the western mountaineers. He had, um, in fact, bought four cars and his style of dressing was marvelous. Nehru started telling us that the younger generations should learn. Fencing is your role model. And a lot of youngsters fell in love with them in a platonic sort of way. So he was a kind of Michael Jackson of his period. It was not only Tenzing's lifestyle that was elevated by his newfound status. The Sherpa people, previously regarded as a race of porters, were now able to work as climbing instructors, tourist guides, and even professional mountaineers in their own right. But despite his status as the greatest Sherpa of all time, Tenzing never climbed Everest again. Though he trained many climbers to make their own attempts, he was never asked to accompany them on their expeditions. In contrast, Hillary embarked on a life of international adventure, scaling other Himalayan peaks and completing an historic crossing of the South Pole. Five men, three tractors and their fuel. That's how the New Zealand Antarctic team, led by Sir Edmund Hillary, reached the South Pole. At the same time as their lives moved apart, the very achievement which had brought Hillary and Tenzing together became a cause of public disagreement between them. In the official account of the final assault on Everest, published in 1953, Hillary appeared to belittle Tenzing's abilities as a climber. We reached the foot of the most formidable looking problem on the ridge. It was a rock step some 40 feet high. Despite the considerable effort involved, my progress, although slow, was steady until I could finally drag myself onto a wide ledge. I took a firm stance on the ledge and signalled to Tenzing to come on up. As I heaved hard on the rope, Tenzing wriggled his way up the crack and finally collapsed exhausted at the top, like a giant fish when it has just been hauled from the sea. When Tenzing published his autobiography some months later, his unhappiness with Hillary's account was apparent. I must be honest and say that I do not feel Hillary's account is wholly accurate. 
he gives the impression that it was only he who really climbed it on his own and that he practically pulled me so that I finally collapsed exhausted at the top like a giant fish. Since then I have had plenty about that fish and I admit I do not like it. For the plain truth is that no one hauled or pulled me up the gap. I climbed it myself, just as Hillary had done. We were not leader and led. We were partners. In laying out his version of the final assault, Tenzing also confronted the question that had taken on such a huge significance. Who really got to the top first? Until this point, he, along with the rest of the team, had kept silent on the subject. But he was finally persuaded to break his silence by his friend and collaborator, Rabindranath Mitra. Tenzing said, I am not going to change my decision. When we sign an agreement that we climb simultaneously, I must stick to that. I told Tenzing, they, well, someday uh, you will die, Hillary will die, but our future generation will say that, well, they climbed the top of Everest, but never they spoke the truth. Because in mountaining, no body mountaineer can go simultaneously. One has to follow the another. Come to leave it to me, I will narrate in such a way it does not reflect any discredit on your part. So he agreed. All over the world I am asked, who got there first? Very well. Now they will know the truth. A little below the summit, Hillary and I stopped. We looked up. I was not thinking of first or second. I did not say to myself, there is a golden apple up there. I will push Hillary aside and run for it. Hillary stepped on top first. I stepped up after him. If it is a discredit to me that I was a step behind Hillary, then I must live with that discredit. But I do not think it was that. Tenzing had finally put an end to the relentless speculation that had dogged him and Hillary ever since the climb. But there would always be a distance between the two men. There were uh, occasional meetings, and Tenzing actually came to New Zealand at one stage, and, and he stayed with the Hillary's, and it was all very cordial. But there wasn't that great warmth that you would feel of two people who had shared some tremendous personal and, and physical experience. And even when you talk to Ed about it, you don't feel that, that warmth. There's a, a, a rather uh, one-step-back attitude in any, in any time he discusses Tenzing and their involvement. In some ways, it was a disappointment to Tenzing. I think that he felt a lot closer to Lambert, the Swiss climber, and I think Tenzing was always disappointed that somehow he didn't pick up that same relationship with Ed. Hillary's life continued to be one of adventure and celebrity. Sir Edmund Hillary, conqueror of Everest, takes a lift to scale New York's mighty Empire State Building. Recognize the driver? He's Everest conqueror Sir Edmund Hillary trying the new rover with his wife. And Sir Edmund Hillary is here to perform the official opening. Skiers, climbers and visitors flock round to see what happens next. I think that it catapulted him out of this basic, simple lifestyle into something that I'm not quite sure whether he's always enjoyed, but I think he's made excellent use of it. As the years went by, Hillary returned increasingly to Nepal where he became absorbed in programs of fundraising and building work for Sherpa communities. In 1975, tragedy struck when his wife and daughter were killed in a plane crash while flying out to join him in Nepal. Devastated, Hillary immersed himself in his building work, work made increasingly difficult by bouts of altitude sickness. I think all these things have affected him. I think that... Um He's nowhere near the laid-back, uh, simple guy he was, understandably. The loss of his wife Louise and his daughter in the plane crash in, in the Himalayas obviously changed him. He has not been a well man for some time. I mean, I was astounded to see movies of him actually moving around Kathmandu with an oxygen mask on and somebody carrying a, a tube of oxygen. You know, just this is at relatively low altitude, so obviously he is quite a victim of altitude sickness. Today, Hillary still lives in New Zealand, and despite his ill health, he continues his close connections with the Himalayas. Tenzing's life was increasingly one of personal unhappiness. 
1976, he had been forced to retire from the Himalayan Mountaineering Institute, the job to which he had been devoted for 22 years and which Nehru had promised him for life. With no pension, Tenzing took work as a tourist guide. His morale and his health declined rapidly. Towards the end, and when I'm talking about the end, not so long before he died, he was becoming an unhappy man. And I met him by chance in China, in Chengdu. When I was out there with a parliamentary delegation, we met absolutely by chance. He with a group of American tourists, and myself and my parliamentary colleagues. And we fell on each other's necks in the, in the dining room, and the whole, all, all the guests got up and cheered. For a moment, we were supremely happy to meet again. But then he, he, he told me privately that he was, he was having, I think, trouble with, with his wife because he was never at home. Uh, and he was getting very tired of it all. I always feel sad that he ended up that way. What he felt lonely about is that he didn't get any good friends around him. That was uh, what I, uh, last time he came to see me, I found that he was lacking good friends. So the last word he told me, two months before his death he came to see me, the Mitra Babu, I have never forgotten you, I have never forgot you in my life. And that's all right, then. So that is the last time I met him. He was sad in his heart. Tenzing died in May 1986. He received a huge state funeral in Darjeeling. He was honored as a national hero in India, in Nepal as the greatest Sherpa who ever lived. He was laid to rest at the Himalayan Mountaineering Institute, 